this afternoon to stand in at short notice. Marianne was obviously going to present an update and she will present a, an update on the stats in the province. Uh, and that will be followed by um, a talk by Andrew um, uh, looking at the current trajectory of the epidemic and how that uh, relates to models of what we can expect uh, in, in terms of the epidemic going forward. Um, so it will also give us uh, plenty of time to ask questions um, and uh, we'll probably have Marianne's talk and then take a few questions about the current stats and then have Andrew's talk take uh, questions around that and have a discussion um, regarding uh, the uh, state of the epidemic um, in, in, in our province. Um, people, as, as we've done before, um, we, the chat function won't be um, live to everybody, but Mark Sundrup will be able to take questions um, from the chat function and put those questions to the speakers. Um, and specifically from our panel uh, today, is, uh, who, who, can, who will be addressing questions to the speakers is, is Mark Mendelssohn and Sean Wasserman from Krudisky and UCT. Uh, so I'd like to hand over to Marianne for the update on the epidemic in the Western Cape. Thanks, Marianne. Um, thanks very much, uh, Graham. Um, Mark, Sandra, are you going to be um, doing the slides for me? I am indeed. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. So very conveniently, before I knew that Andrew was going to come to my rescue, I added his name to the slide. <laughs> Um, and uh, today we, I'm going to do a little bit of an update on the numbers and then I've added in some additional detail about the analysis that I shared three weeks ago around looking at comorbidities and predictors of death um, in the Western Cape. Um, so this is the dashboard updated today that we always start off with. Um, uh, as you know, the country nationally has reached over 100,000 cases. Half of those are in the Western Cape, but considerably more than um, 50,000 people certainly have COVID in the Western Cape. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how testing numbers have dropped off and how we really can't rely on those case numbers anymore. And we now are at over 1,500 deaths in the Western Cape. I want to highlight from the map that we still see um, quite large differences geographically uh, in terms of location, uh, particularly between the metro and rural. And in fact, we've had a, a look at um, the likelihood of dying from COVID uh, to date, uh, uh, depending on where you live. And it's about half as much in rural. That's not because uh, people in rural are less likely to die once they get COVID, but because they're less likely to get COVID in the first place. And in certain sub-districts in the metro, we certainly have seen considerably greater spread and even after we adjust for age and comorbidities, considerably higher risk of having died from COVID until this time point. We move to the next slide. Um, so this is the slide I show every time I present, which looks at uh, the number of admissions and deaths and proportions admitted to ICU. And I think it's always nice to put the arrow in to say, well, where were we last time? So at the moment, in terms of our numbers, and I want to highlight that for admissions, we're talking about confirmed COVID cases. Um, so laboratory confirmed diagnoses. So this doesn't include PUIs and it doesn't include people who may have false negative tests, but where clinicians have decided that this should be considered a COVID case. So if you look at the blue line, we're now sitting at about um, 175 admissions per day. And you can see that three weeks ago when I last presented, that arrow points to um, about 125. But in fact, what I presented was about 90. And the reason for that is because of delays in reporting. So the 175 that I'm talking about today is probably actually um, a little bit higher than that. Uh, the proportion going to ICU um, since pretty much mid-May has remained constant at well below 10%. And our deaths, and Andrew's going to really talk to this in a little bit more detail, are staying pretty constant at around 40 to 50 per day. Um, some fluctuations depending on uh, exact reporting times. Um, 
and and then the number in ICU is, is also kind of following what we would expect in terms of just the proportion of admissions. We can move to the next slide. Um, so this is really a, a introduction to the modeling, which Andrew is going to cover in more detail. On the left hand side, we're looking at um, on the, the vertical axis, the log of the cumulative number of deaths starting on the day since um, each area reached 10 confirmed deaths. Um, and what you can see is the Western Cape, which is the blue line um, that we were following uh, quite uh, um, consistently a doubling time of about eight days in deaths. That seems to have slowed down slightly in the last few days. And I think Andrew will interrogate that. Some of that is probably due to reporting delays um, as well, but, but uh, Andrew will interrogate that more in his modeling talk. And then if we start looking at some of the other provinces, so the Eastern Cape is the uh, thin yellow line below that, um, Gauteng, the green line, and Kezid in the grey line and the rest of South Africa, the, the pale blue line right at the bottom. Um, you can see that certainly the Eastern Cape and Gauteng are starting to, to catch up and really following pretty much the same rate of increase as us, although um, somewhat uh, lagging behind. And on the right hand side, what we're looking at is uh, from the MRC report that was released yesterday, which looks at all deaths from natural causes. And you can see that Cape Town had clearly gone over the upper limit of what is expected for this time of year, which is shown by the red lines. Um, but um, that just in the last week, it seems to have flattened off a little bit. And, and again, uh, that, that Andrew will talk a little bit more to that. And then I thought it was interesting just to see what's going on in some of the rest of the country. And Nelson Mandela Bay has been in the news a lot this week. And it really looks like they're experiencing where we were about a week or two ago. And they've now also breached the upper limit of what is expected. And we can go next slide. Um, I wanted to highlight what's happened in terms of testing. And I think we all know that uh, we had the terrible period with uh, huge backlogs in testing and um, uh, not, not getting results quickly enough when we were doing huge numbers of tests. And the numbers of tests have decreased dramatically, as you can see on the left hand side, and also in the graph at the bottom of the, the actual samples collected. And then we shifted to the change in testing strategy um, with only testing people who are needing hospital admission or those with comorbidities or over the age of 55 years. And I've indicated where that is on, in the red arrow on the slide. And just to show how big that reduction is, is if we have to look at tests um, in the 7th to the 21st of June, so a two week period, compared to the last two weeks of May, there's been a 58% reduction in the number of tests done. The bottom slide, the orange line is based on the modeling projections, the number of tests that should actually be needed if we were to test everybody over 55 or with comorbidities who has um, symptomatic disease. And this is um, already assuming that we, we only test uh, not all of those people, but a fraction of those people who would present sick enough to warrant testing and would access care. And you can see that clearly we are uh, there, there's um, quite a big disconnect or a gap between the numbers that we should be seeing presenting for testing or being tested um, and uh, what, what's actually being done. And part of that may be that that projected number is based on uh, the previous iteration of the model and Andrew will talk to the newer iteration which has a slightly flatter um, peak, but uh, clearly there is a big gap in terms of actually reaching uh, the patients that we should be reaching in terms of the testing criteria. And then on the right hand side uh, at the top just really echoes that is we have seen really just consistently increases in the proportion positive, um, suggesting both increasing spread but also increasing triaging of testing to those most likely to be positive. And we actually had to change the axis of 
this, the y-axis of the slide for the second time since the start of the outbreak. It used to stop at 40% and today we changed it to go right up to 60%. We can go to the next slide. So what I wanted to highlight in this slide is to show how that change in testing and restricting testing, what impact has that had in what the patients that are actually testing positive over time. So on the left hand side, we're looking in the solid lines at all cases and the dashed lines at hospitalized cases. And um, the blue is showing the median age and the red is showing the proportion who are men. And uh, this is just in adult patients uh, over the age of 20 years. And if you move down to the next slide, um, the, you'll see that there was a period in April, which was really that time of um, community screening and testing and where we were doing lots of workplace screening and really very actively looking for cases where the median age particularly dropped and the proportion of men dropped and that was probably largely related to finding lots of cases in the retail sector in particular. And we can now see um, as testing has been more constrained and with the change in testing criteria that uh, we've shifted to uh, testing older people and uh, testing of more men and that consistently, as we would expect, our median age in hospital is older than our cases and we see a high proportion of men in hospital compared to in our cases as a whole. On the right hand side, we're looking at the proportion of cases with comorbidities and I realize there are a lot of lines on that slide and it's quite busy. So I'm just going to focus on three in particular, which is hypertension in gray, diabetes, which is in the light blue and HIV, which is in the dark blue. And what you can see is we've got this for hypertension and diabetes, quite a nice uh, view almost. And again, in that period with expanded testing, and a lot of workplace testing, we see relatively healthier people with fewer comorbidities, but also during that period, more people with HIV because of the predominance of testing, I think in young people, younger adults. And then as we've shifted towards more constrained testing and um, uh, the, the new criteria that we see increasing proportions with comorbidities suggesting that uh, certainly the, the criteria are being followed, although whether we're reaching everybody with comorbidities who should be tested uh, is, is clearly a different question. We can move to the next slide. And so I thought it was interesting just to look um, at what does this mean when we look at case fatality rates over time. Um, and I want to highlight that this is case fatality just in public sector adults. And so these, uh, particularly when you look at the cases, these case fatality rates or probabilities of death are higher than for the epidemic as a whole. And um, essentially the red line in the cases slide on the left-hand side corresponds to that gray, gray block area that I showed on the previous slide. And so you can see that um, these are, are unadjusted, but in that period where we were doing expanded testing and identifying many people and included in that time was people who were asymptomatic, that we had lower case fatality and that that has increased um, in the more recent period. But that if we look amongst admitted patients, there really hasn't been much change over time. So uh, we're seeing a pretty similar outcomes uh, in the admitted patients. And then, we can move to the next slide. And in these last few slides, I just wanted to um, give an update and a little bit more detail on some of the work that I shared before, looking at um, risk factors for death in our setting. And um, uh, to highlight that uh, there was a report uh, in the special bulletin of the NICD for those who want to read more details of this is now available on the NICD website. And two things that we've updated. The first thing is that we've added diabetic control and that we are seeing um, quite clear increased mortality for those with poor diabetic control. This doesn't mean that if you control diabetes um, acutely that it's going to improve your outcomes because this probably reflects longstanding 
uh, microvascular disease, but that certainly if one wants to look at risk, people with poor diabetic control, as has been seen in other studies, um, is associated with worse outcomes. And then um, uh, I think it doesn't show, but right at the bottom of the slide, what has also been added is that what we've done in addition is to take into account location, um, so urban versus rural, and then within the metro sub-district. And if you go to the next slide, just in terms of the effects um, or the hazard ratios for um, HIV in particular, there was concern about whether this could be confounded by socioeconomic status, and there probably was some confounding by socioeconomic status because the risk has attenuated from our previous analysis of about 2.75 to about 2.15, um, but that this is now at least adjusted for sub-district and that we've looked within certain sub-districts as well, and we see this effect consistently within every sub-district within the metro. Um, slide doesn't seem to have advanced, but we can keep going. And then um, I think this is quite useful to highlight in this talk because a lot of the, the talks in this uh, webinar series focus on risk factors for mortality. And what we've been able to do in this analysis is to compare looking at three different uh, groups or three different ways of doing the analysis. The first is to look at the risks for death in the population, which is on the left-hand side. The second is in the cases and the third is just in the admitted patients, which is on the right-hand side. And just because this is a busy slide, um, what I've done is to group age and sex at the top in the green box, the NCDs in blue, um, and the TB and HIV risks at the bottom in red. And what I want to highlight is that particularly for the comorbidities, as we restrict to a group of patients at greater risk of poor outcomes, so either cases who are symptomatic enough to warrant testing and to bother to present to a facility to be identified, or um, in the more extreme situation, hospital admissions, that we are restricting to a population at greatest risk of um, poor outcomes, and therefore the effect of the comorbidities on risk of death gets attenuated. And so when reading studies, we're all interested to know what are the risk factors for mortality, but when reading those studies, it's important to look at uh, what population is actually included and whether it's restricted to cases or hospital admissions, which and, and how those were selected. And I think, oh, I've got one more slide. And then I just wanted to um, do a little bit of a deeper dive into comparing the deaths in those with and without HIV. And um, so this is, uh, again, slightly updated numbers. So we now have over 100 deaths in the public sector in people with HIV. And what you can see if you look at the age distribution is that clearly um, the deaths in people with HIV are in younger people. And we would expect that because we know the prevalence of HIV um, is much higher in younger people. But this is over and above what we would expect just based on differences in HIV prevalence. If we move to the chronic non-communicable diseases, and we can go down to the next slide, um, you can see that those are much less, although there are um, a high proportion of the deceased HIV patients do have uh, chronic non-communicable diseases uh, in general, this is less so than the HIV negatives, except um, for chronic kidney disease, which is similar. Um, and then in contrast, as we would expect, and just go down to the bottom box, if we look at uh, tuberculosis, that we see a much higher proportion with uh, current and previous tuberculosis in those with HIV. And one of our next steps in terms of taking this analysis further is to work out, um, at the moment we've separated out HIV and tuberculosis in our analysis as risk factors for death, but to say if we weren't to adjust for HIV, how much of the effect of HIV is actually mediated through tuberculosis. And I'll leave it there and happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Marianne, uh, great update. Um, I just wanted to start off with the one question um, very much on the second last slide, slide 11 there, if you could bring that up 
Mark. Um, just uh, regarding chronic uh, pulmonary disease, um, just wondered what the, the definition in the database for that was and how well it's been um, ascertained. And then I noticed among hospital admissions, it almost seemed to be protective and that, that was surprising. Is that just a spurious finding, do you think? Um, so I think uh, the, so the first thing to say is it's, it's very poorly ascertained and it's based on patients receiving salbutamol and I can see all the clinicians sort of rolling their eyes and um, throwing their hands up in horror as I say that, um, but it's the best that we've got um, as an attempt to adjust for it. And then in the hospital admissions, I think once you restrict to a group of people who um, are sick enough to get into hospital, um, I mean, I think finding that it's protective is, is probably, uh, you know, spurious and, and just uh, the proportions are quite small in any event. Mm. But you can see these quite strange um, associations once you restrict to people in hospital. And in fact, one of the criticisms around the studies uh, that have shown different effects of smoking is around, um, uh, around whether the restriction has included people um, only people in hospital versus cases. So some of the hospital studies, for example, I think have suggested that mm -hmm. uh, smoking is protective, but someone who is um, admitted and is a smoker might actually be healthier than other people who've ended up in hospital with other comorbidities mm -hmm. the reason for their admission. So I think we could argue that uh, people where their main reason for admission is COPD might, for example, be less likely to be diabetic or might be younger. Um, and, and so that might explain yeah, it, I think, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I guess um, the other reason is, is if somebody does have a underlying COPD or asthma, clinicians might have a tendency to admit them to hospital just because of concern about their background, even though they aren't actually that sick from COVID itself. And, and so they're a less sick uh, group of patients um, as, as a, on average than, than people uh, that might be just admitted because of their COVID pneumonia. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a very nice blog which I can send if anybody's interested mm -hmm. around selection bias in admitted patients. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to open it to the uh, panel members. I, I got it wrong at the start. I, I said Sean Wasserman was one of our panel members, but it's actually Sipo Lamini and, and Mark Mendelssohn. Uh, Sipo, have you got any questions that you wanted to ask or, or Mark? Uh, anything to bring you in? Hi. Hi. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. And uh, good afternoon, colleagues. And thanks, Marianne. Marianne, um, if you can just clarify the point that you've, you, you made. You talked about uh, so, uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, status, but I think you were relating it to HIV. Um, uh, can you just clarify uh, how that uh, influences uh, outcomes? And did you just only look for it in HIV or did you look at it as an independent variable in, in the patients uh, who are presenting with, with COVID-19? Thanks. Um, so I think the concern is that uh, people with HIV tend to come from groups with low socioeconomic status and that low socioeconomic status might, particularly in the population analysis, put you at greater risk of acquiring COVID in the first place um, because you may live in a, a more densely populated informal settlement area and be someone who uses public transport and um, a whole host of of other things associated with living in a poorer area, but also obviously low socioeconomic status or, or poorer socioeconomic status is a risk factor for, um, for death and has been shown to be a risk factor for COVID death. So we adjusted for it across the analysis and it does actually impact on almost all, I think on all the risk factors. So, so taking it into account was, I think the right thing to do. Um, it's quite crude because it's based on sub-district of residence, which is obviously there within sub-districts, there's still huge heterogeneity. And to try to even get a better handle on it, we looked, for example, restricted just to uh, sub-districts where perhaps there's slightly less heterogeneity, like Kailiche and Kipfontaine. But we fully acknowledge that there probably is still some residual confounding from, because we can't adjust for individual level socioeconomic status. Thanks, thanks, Sipo. Um, Mark, was there anything at this stage that you wanted to 
Awesome. Thank, yeah. So th thanks very much, um, Marianne. I mean, I mean, two things. One comment, one um, one question. I mean, comment. You know, as as ever, is it, is this? You know, you 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 put up the slide of of testing and the testing strategy. You mentioned our testing strategy in the Western Cape of testing patients who um, are over 55 with comorbidities. Um, but the crux of the, of the matter still uh, is that nobody can explain properly what anyone is doing with that test. Um, the fact that they're doing a test is irrelevant. It's the advice that's given. So the testing strategy still needs to be um, looked at very carefully. And I think uh, properly explained and understood, particularly as as we've seen, Kaoteng, uh, where Eastern Cape and other areas now increasing their case numbers, and the fact that almost certainly a lot of the resources that are going to that have been directed towards the Western Cape to clear the, the futile backlog are now going to be directed elsewhere. But the, the question I have, rather than the comment, is, you know, what should the marker now be, really, of defining how the epidemic is is going within the Western Cape if we're not testing as we would have hoped, obviously, if we were able to contact trace and isolate. I mean, is it screening numbers? Is it admissions? Is it mortality? What, what's your feeling on what the best market would be? So that's probably a, a good introduction, actually, to Andrew's talk. Um, I mean, I think the hardest outcome that we've got is death and um, and that's uh, certainly what we should be watching. And if we could get that number right, even if we can't get the, the rest right, that would be most useful for surveillance. Um, unfortunately, even that number is difficult. Uh, so patients, I think those on the clinical platform will know that patients who um, die precipitously or are, are dead on arrival uh, may not be swabbed. So we may not know um, about, about those deaths. And, um, uh, also, there may be false negative tests amongst the deceased, but I think um, that's probably our our best outcome. And um, what we have been able to do um, for patients on in terms of deaths that we don't know about that are happening in the community um, in in our known COVID uh, patients is to link for those that do have ID numbers to the mortality register through the MRC. And that has also uncovered um, quite a, an additional fraction of deaths. So um, I think if we can uh, put our energy into getting that right, then that would be our best indicator of, of where we're at. Um, uh, Graham, it's Mark here. Just if we have two questions we can quickly deal with, uh, which are relevant. The one Mark, is can I, Mark, can I just, um, at, at this kind of halfway point, just uh, for those colleagues who joined late, just say that uh, unfortunately our speaker from Brazil had to cancel really at the last minute um, due to personal emergency reasons and, and apologize so we're having a, a session focused on the local epidemic. Mark, uh, your two questions? Yeah, so from uh, two people on the chat line which is open uh, to ask questions. Marianne, do we know anything about CD4 counts in the HIV population? Uh, and the other question is do we uh, are we able to drill down in the data, particularly for healthcare workers? Uh, maybe question open to yourselves as well, Graham, Mark, Sipo, uh, uh, whether we have any idea as to the acquisition in healthcare workers, is it work-related or community-related, or do we simply don't know? Um, thanks. So I, I meant to say at the start of the talk, I'm sorry that I'm a, we're a poor replacement for, <laughs> for the Brazilian um, that we were meant to, to have, but we're doing our best. Um, in terms of uh, looking at CD4 counts, so it's very difficult um, because um, the majority of the cases are uh, or certainly the COVID cases, about two thirds are virally suppressed. And that means that because of our um, national guidelines around CD4 testing, we actually don't have prior CD4 counts um, in many of those patients. We did look at viral suppression and the results are quite difficult to interpret. We have seen that the risk seems to exist across all strata of people who are suppressed and are not suppressed. Um, and it may be that in unsuppressed people, 
um, the factors driving increased mortality are different to suppressed people. So people who've been suppressed and who've been well on art for several years may be more likely to be those who are older and with comorbidities and metabolic syndrome, whereas uh, people who are not suppressed or have recently started art, um, uh, they might be more in terms of immune dysfunction uh, driving their um, increased risk of death, but I think there's a lot more work to be done there. Um, if we do look uh, particularly at patients known to be poorly controlled, there does seem to be perhaps a slightly increased risk of death compared to those definitely well on treatment, but the numbers are extremely small at the moment and the confidence intervals overlap widely. And one of the things that want to highlight in this kind of data set is that um, we restrict it to patients who we're most likely to know about their comorbidities and we're most likely to know about their outcomes. So people who've been active in the public sector um, at least once in the last three years. Um, and But for those who we know the least about, we're also least likely to know what happened to them. And it's possible that they're no longer in the province or um, that they even may have died before COVID and we don't know about it. So if we look at the people, for example, who've never started art or who we know nothing about their suppression or their CD4, um, they, they actually don't seem to do terribly badly. But I think that that is probably driven by the fact that um, uh, in terms of the, that denominator, quite a few of those people may no longer be living in the province or, or may have died. And so um, it's very difficult to say much about that group. And uh, the same for the diabetics where we have no measure of control, who don't seem to be, who seem to be at less increased risk than the controlled diabetics. But I think that's because we know less about their outcomes. Um, in terms of the healthcare workers, um, I think I haven't personally uh, been responsible for looking at the healthcare worker analysis, but I think we're seeing a mix of acquisition in the community and at the workplace, and the clinicians can probably comment that a lot of the transmission seems to be from one healthcare worker to another um, outside of the clinical setting rather than within the wards, but I'll leave that for um, those actually working in the wards to comment. Yeah, I think... Um... I'll just keep that answer brief. I think now that the epidemic has evolved, it's very difficult to um, be sure where people have acquired their infection. And I'm sure it's a mix now of the wards, uh, healthcare settings, uh, but not in the wards and, and in the community and in transport. Um, but it's becoming far more difficult to, to pinpoint in individual cases. Um, but I did want to move on to the next uh, speaker, who is Andrew Bull. Um, and Andrew's going to give us um, an update on the current trajectory of the epidemic and how that relates to, to modeling uh, of where we are projected to head uh, in the COVID epidemic in the Western Cape. And just to say thanks again to Andrew and Marianne for, for um, expanding the talk in the case of Marianne and um, stepping in at short notice in the, in the case of Andrew. Uh, great. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks very much, Graham. Andrew, we're not hearing you. Yeah, no, I've just uh, lost the window, but I'll, I'll find it again. Um, okay, so so um, what I'm going to present now is a um, an update that we provide every week to to um, to a transversal government team that are responsible for the strategy around the epidemic, and it's um, uh, where we are at the moment was not a place that we could easily interpret, so it might sound a little bit uh, un 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 uncertain. Um, And, and you'll, you'll, you'll understand why in a moment. So, so this first slide just shows where we are relative to the various models that um, have been used in governments since the beginning of March. 
and uh, I suppose it's a very transparent slide because it shows you how, how uh, fluctuating the estimates have been starting with the very early SESIMA estimates through to some internal scenarios through to the uh, national official models through to calibrations of those models through the Western Cape and through to most recently a re recalibrations of those models in the last few days. Um, the left hand the left hand graph is uh, cumulative deaths and, the, and it's useful because it helps us look at where we end up relative to other countries. So um, the first couple of, of scenarios ended up at about 7,000 deaths, which is 1,000 deaths per million, uh, which you know, when, when you can look at the global, global experience and, and, and reflect that number on, on, onto that, um, which, which uh, at a country level, that, that's already uh, very, very high in terms of countries ahead of us with the epidemic. And the, the right-hand number is the total number of beds uh, uh, high care, uh, uh, ICU, and uh, general beds combined. The the MOVE line is the the national, what's called the national uh, COVID nineteen epi model MCEM, um, uh, calibrated the Western Cape about six weeks ago, uh, using the early mortality and inpatient data that we had, and so the, that was their first set of estimates for us and what we've been tracking against. The turquoise line, the other dark line, is the most recent calibration. It's still preliminary, and it was just uh, trying to recalibrate based on the data up until about a week ago. Okay, so this is the recalibration of the NCEM model. Um, and uh, the, the, previous, uh, the previous model had quite a precipitous uh, exponential uh, rise in cases until most of the population was presumed to be infected and the peak uh, towards the end of June, which is not far from now. Um, the recalibration, uh, firstly, um, it's got a broader, a broader, uh, lower uh, mortality curve, so the total area under the curve is higher, so it's got a, a greater uh, estimate in the total number of deaths. Um, but they've also, um, and, and, and the, peak to, the peak number of deaths per day is a little bit lower, which is important for, for example, the city of Cape Town who are responsible for fatalities management within the metro. Um, and then they, they've also calibrated to the changing hospital experience. So, so when we started, uh, the, um, the national estimate for the number of bed days required for every person who died was, 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 was over 150 because they had a very uh, convoluted uh, clinical care pathway that was based on expert opinion about how patients would traverse the system and, and what the mortality rates would be. Our mortality is, has progressively gotten higher in uh, inpatient mortality. So the bed utilization for every person who ends up with severe disease and, and who dies is, is therefore lower. And certainly our ICU use is, is, is lower. So it brings the bed utilization quite closely in line with the original projections, which themselves may be difficult to realize, but in terms of the original bed planning scenarios. Okay, this is the Actuarial Society recalibration. So this is a, a national model that's been developed by the Actuarial Society for the profession and many of the uh, actuaries who work on this work in industries where they are required to, to estimate more, um, mortality risk uh, and illness risk for the, uh, um, for the industries that they work in. Um, and the top, the top uh, panels are the calibrations to the cumulative hospitalization, cumulative ICU, which although it looks like it's not calibrating well, because the proportion of patients who get uh, admitted to ICU relative to all admissions is declining over time due to our capacity constraints and changing clinical uh, practice, the um, we, and, and the models don't have the complexity to change that parameter over time. Uh, it's understandable that, the, that that curve is as it is. It's calibrated reasonably well to the cumulative deaths and reasonably well to the daily deaths. And as you move to the bottom panel, which is the outputs, um, the, 
slightly higher area under the curve because again it's shifted out and lower and 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 therefore slightly higher mortality than they had pre estimated previously. Last time around, the this model also uh, anticipated greater mortality, um, uh, lower uh, peak mortality, and lower but still higher than the other model uh, hospital projected hospital utilization. Um, uh, I was I generally present this to an audience that know these the, these models reasonably well, so I haven't put much uh, detail about them here. They're standard compartment uh, models, and the way that they curtail the epidemic is uh, by assuming that a large proportion, so 60 to 90 percent of the population, becomes infected, and uh, thereby uh, uh, and herd immunity kicks in and and that might not be a completely reasonable assumption because we haven't seen that anywhere in the world based on on serology the uh, the first model um, assumed to, to achieve those high levels of population infection with the same levels of admission and mortality that they, that would have seem plausible and based on some early serology evidence the the um, uh, the national model assumes 75% of all infections are asymptomatic. This version of the ASA model has reduced that assumption to 50%, which also, uh, if you use uh, uh, globe, if you use comparative infection fatality rates as uh, other uh, places have seen based on serology, and apply them to a lower proportion asymptomatic, you get high high mortality, and that's one of the other reasons for the uh, increased mortality output. The ASA model makes some uh, allowance for heterogeneity and risk of acquisition, meaning that that to try and uh, cater for this kind of super spreader type of, of uh, transmission pattern where a few people are responsible for a, a larger number of the infections, and and uh, that's that allows them to to slow down the, the growth of the epidemic, but it still makes no differential assumption about the proportion of the population that are ultimately susceptible. And one of the big unknown questions is whether there's uh, some heterogeneity and in, in susceptibility uh, overall over and above heterogeneity in, tra in, in transmission. And that, that last assumption may well be critical to what proportion of the population ends up being infected and what the overall uh, burden of the epidemic will be in the first wave. So this is now tracking. This is uh, now tracking what uh, what's happening on the provincial platform, and I can see the slides are being cut off slightly at the bottom. Um, so we look every week at, uh, and the numbers will be very maybe quite difficult to see, at the the number of deaths, and and both the week before and this week, uh, by the end of the weekend, we were seeing 260 known COVID deaths in the province in the preceding week. But by the time we looked a week later, that had gone up to, to over 300. And, and that, uh, we, we can, that's probably uh, got a lot to do with late administrative data coming through, as well as um, uh, late diagnosis coming through in people that, that had died, but we didn't know that there were COVID deaths. And you can see the, the, the new, newly calibrated model catches it don't worry about the, the 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 downturn at the end. That's that's probably lag, but catches it correctly at the end, but has under underestimated for for quite a bit of the last period, and it's almost impossible to to have an uh, exponentially growing epidemic and mirror our hospitalisation curve, which has become quite flat because of our capacity constraints. So this is now mortality um, against the old and the new projections. And uh, up until a couple of weeks ago, the, the old projections, so well, they were calibrated to our mortality. So as expected, they calibrated reasonably well. The blue are the measured deaths on our platform. The orange are the uh, estimated uh, underreporting that will still come in based on the, our history of the lag between when a death happens and when it's reported. The um, the grey are is an estimate which might end up being increased uh, of the number of deaths that are missed based on those patients with ID numbers who we who the who are on the population register as having died but which we hadn't ascertained, 
and the yellow is a very imprecise measure of what proportion of patients dying in our hospitals are uh, um, probably COVID related, but, but we haven't made the diagnosis, a percentage of the PUIs, the P people who are admitted under the COVID specialty where we don't have a, a confirmed COVID diagnosis and nevertheless died. And you can see that the two new models have tried to catch the most recent data on that um, uh, and, and how that shifts the peak out further and, and lower. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the calibration with the, uh, with the mortality. And um, it is quite a peculiar curve. So one of the questions is, is this flattening here real? Or as pressure on the platform has increased, are we just missing more and more deaths? So there's actually a continuing increase in, in deaths, but we, we, we're missing them. And for that last question, we have the advantage in South Africa of having a reasonably good vital registration system. And so the MRC are getting daily data from the population register and uh, looking at the deaths currently compared to the deaths um, and in previous years, and Marianne showed you uh, the output from them. At the time that we put this together, we only had the previous week's data until the 9th of June. And comparing where we would have been, um, somewhere between average and, and the bottom, and the reason why we're not taking the average is because we know that globally, a lot of um, uh, the, the interventions around COVID have resulted in lower mortality, largely lower because of non uh, um, non-natural uh, deaths being lower, but even natural deaths have been lower in this period. And this is a just natural deaths only. And you can see that there's province-wide, there's an excess in the black line over that over what we might have expected of over 300 deaths and in the, in the city, maybe 300. In that same period, 1st to the 9th of June, we had uh, measured uh, 288 known deaths in patients with a laboratory confirmed diagnosis of COVID. And if we put in those um, corrections that are the other colors that I mentioned, it could take us up to as high as 370 deaths. So our measurement of mortality with corrections is probably not uh, grossly underestimating uh, mortality. Uh, the, uh, the population register itself is also not fully complete because it doesn't include people without ID numbers uh, who may be dying. Um, and the models, the old model would have uh, slightly overprojected, and the new model uh, is uh, un underprojecting for the um, for that number. Moving it forward one week, uh, this is the same version that Marianne just showed you, which is not not far from where we are now, up until the 16th of June. You can see how how big the deficit is with the old model. And it, and it really does hit that period where our mortality is flatter, and so we can really interrogate whether that's artifact or real. And certainly what we've seen and what's on the population register do mirror each other. So just let's look at Cape Town first. You'll see that, that the, the number of excess deaths, the number of deaths uh, the, the, that, that most recent week compared to the previous one is almost the same. Um, it isn't a period where the, the, the background mortality might have dropped slightly, so maybe it has increased slightly. Um, for the whole of the Western Cape, there's a, an excess of maybe 400 deaths, and for the Cape Town, 350. And our estimation from those, the, 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 the confirmed plus the assumed under, undercounted deaths is, close, is around 400. So it does suggest that the pattern that we're seeing from a temporal and trend perspective is not out of keeping with the, with the registered deaths um, uh, more, more generally. So that, that does, does give uh, some room for uh, speculation. And, and from, uh, so, so there are quite a few people have followed the epidemic uh, curves of rich countries and said, look, they all started curtailing after about 70 days. And, and this is just the natural history of a, of a viral epidemic. And, Cape Town's peaking, um, or the Western Cape is, uh, and the, 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 this is just that natural peak. What's very different is that most of those countries where there was a curtailment of the epidemic have had massive uh, state-led uh, interventions, and 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 the serology has suggested that it wasn't herd immunity, but the interventions themselves that were responsible for that curtailment. We've 
gradually lessened our interventions over that over this period so we would actually be expecting transmission to be increasing not decreasing um, one of the questions is whether uh, this actually i should have shown before that discussion i've just had is whether we're missing deaths on the hospital platform so the the top line here the, the gray on top of blue is the uh, the 2019 hospital deaths per uh, per day um, and uh, the green is the 2020 and the line at the bottom is the COVID, the COVID confirmed um, uh, deaths in, in, on the public sector hospital platform and at the end of the line you can see the COVID comes down and the green goes up which is probably the lag in ascertainment of, of, of COVID status. The question is in this period just before was there an increase um, uh, you know, have we missed uh, some some deaths? And our, our assessment is that the allowances that we're already making for some deaths in PUIs probably accounts for any kind of uh, uh, coming together of these lines that that might not have been expected. So, we, so there's no evidence on the hospital platform that we're massively missing uh, uh, COVID COVID deaths. Um, talking about hospitalization, I discussed this graph already, the blue line being combined uh, uh, general care and ICU care, the yellow line being ICU care. Um, this is the, 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 um, the new models I've got are better calibrated because they've, they're quite recently calibrated, but even within the two weeks since the data that they calibrated to, um, the hospitalization is flatter than, than they would have um, uh, suggested. And similarly, if we go through an, an exercise, um, uh, trying to put piece together the, the hospitalization, the, the bottom yellow is the public sector ICU capacity. And, and our understanding is that that's pretty much maxed out at the moment at close to around 100 uh, ICU beds. The red is a public sector ICU, the lighter green is a public sector general care, the olive green is a private sector general care, and the gray is everybody who's admitted under the COVID specialty, um, but without a COVID to confirm COVID diagnosis. And it includes quite a few people who don't even have a COVID test result. So it's quite a curious group and uh, we don't think the specialty is being that accurately used. Um, but even uh, putting them all together, we get reasonable calibration with the most recent uh, models, but, but a massive shortfall of what the, the previous projections were telling us could have happened. And just to maybe reflect that the previous projections weren't a definitive version of what would happen. They were a version of uh, what the data prior to the calibration were consistent with in terms of what could happen. And so what we needed to, to look at from a provisioning, from a provisioning perspective. So to get to the part, the part that, that's more difficult to make sense of is given that we've had a general slowdown in, in deaths, uh, a massive slowdown in cases, which as Marianne presented earlier from the testing, changing testing strategy, is very difficult to unravel from what is, what is related to strategy and what is related to, to um, incidents. The NICD put out the estimate of the, of the, um, the real uh, reproductive number, the current reproductive number based on cases making adjustments for testing strategy. And their estimate coming out of lockdown into stage, into stage four was that the reproductive number had declined in the Western Cape from close to two to about 1.4 in late May. Um, and, the, and that's curious because this was coming out of lockdown into a, a, a less restricted uh, 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 societal uh, circumstance from a transmission perspective. If we work backwards from the deaths, which we consider a more reliable data source uh, and, try and, and try and calculate, uh, back calculate a reproductive number for the same period, applying a delay from infection to death and, um, and an average uh, uh, serial interval, we get down to about 1.2 being what the current estimate would be based on the kind of change in growth of, 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 of numbers, um, which is quite difficult to reconcile with the with the projections that, that have continuing increase until you reach um, herd, herd immunity. And this is an independent assessment um, 
of the reproductive number, the blue being from cases and the and the the red is from from deaths, also suggesting that um, if that was the case, it was coming down. So so one of the the theories is that well maybe we've we've got a very heterogeneous uh, population with some communities of, that have had very high um, incidence of incidence and and of of COVID, and that they might be slowing down, and we haven't yet had uh, the um, micro epidemics in other communities getting to, getting uh, to the level levels that that really drive clinical events uh, in the same way, and that maybe we've had, we've hit a bit of a lag, and that might be um, the, go with the fact that the clinical platform over the last couple of days have reported a, a definite sense of increasing pressure. Um, increasing uh, increasing admissions and and yesterday the the mortality number was was uh, reported which doesn't mean that happened yesterday because it's sometimes because of the lag but yesterday we reported 80, 80, 80 deaths 78 deaths for the day which is one of the high I think it's the highest we've ever reported and this is the the deaths per million for Kyalicha and Clipfontaine and if you were to imagine that uh, these, these are places where the um, daily deaths might still be climbing, but the rate of climb might be decline, might be the rate of change might be decreasing. They've already reached over 500 per million, meaning that the same number would be expected to be um, the same number of deaths would would be expected uh, on the way down. So if this was a classical epidemic curve, these communities are going to achieve mortality population mortality rate of over a thousand per million, which was our kind of benchmark as the worst case scenario for the for the Western Cape as a whole. So the question is, is are these communities kind of saturating the, if you back calculate from infection fatality ratios, what the proportion infected in these communities should be, it could be 20 to 30 percent. We don't yet have any serology to um, interrogate that. Um, so this is a very preliminary, we did try and look at the um, the rate of change in daily deaths by firstly uh, Kailicha, Mitchell's Plain and uh, Clipfontaine together where we've had the most deaths coming from and then from the rest of the metro where um, uh, yeah, the rest of the metro being in orange and then from the rural areas being in green and um, from that we can we can't really see a pattern we can we can see that the the rest of the metro and those three high incidence communities have got a very similar growth pattern and this very similar kind of leveling of trajectory. And not, un not unsurprisingly, the, the rate of growth and outside the metro is faster because they, they, it's kind of starting to take off, take off there a bit more now. So then to conclude, the new calibrations estimate a lower, later peak, but with a greater area under the curve and more deaths. Um, the scenarios, um, uh, the, we are awaiting some scenarios in which, um, although there's no data in which to, with which to calibrate, uh, different assumptions are made about population susceptibility and, and those will give us some, some uh, greater uh, a different number of, of scenarios to look at. Um, both models are premised on the lessening of restrictions after lockdown re resulting in a larger effective reproductive number, um, which is at odds with what we're actually seeing from the uh, trajectory that uh, in, in, in deaths over the last couple of weeks. Um, we estimate the current mortality, daily mortality due to COVID after allowing for all possible undercounting and underreporting to probably be around 60 deaths a day. Uh, yesterday was reported as uh, 78 deaths. Um, and that the admission data show a similar pattern uh, of the last week to previous weeks. Um, but the qualitative feedback from the platform is that there's definitely more pressure uh, on, on the platform and a continued progressive increase in burden. And I think that's, that's all I have. Um, I don't know if I've left any time for questions, Graham. Right. Thanks, Andrew. That was a fantastic overview of, of where we're at and where we are projected to head. So just, I mean, to, in a nutshell, uh, the, the, the current best modeling projection or that would fit with the current data would see us peak uh, in around mid-August with a, an accumulative number of 10,000 deaths in the Western Cape. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, 10, 10 to 12,000. Yeah. Yeah. 
and and mid August would be would be the, the uh, end of July, mid August. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I've, I've got one or two questions, but I wanted to first uh, throw it up into Mark and Sipa. Mark, are you? Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I was just having um, difficulty uh, unmuting. Andrew, thanks. F fantastic. Um, I may have I may have missed this. So apologies, but you you showed fairly good data that we probably weren't missing deaths in hospital. But with the change in the testing strategy, are we missing deaths in the community? So, so Mark, uh, we assumed that we were, and we've made some uh, adjustments for underreporting uh, based on home affairs comparison. But the reassuring thing is that the trend that we're seeing seems to be consistent with the trend on the population register. Uh, so, and and uh, so what we've measured and what the MRC have measured from the population register have tracked very well. So um, we had thought that maybe this last couple of weeks have seen an increasing gap in known deaths uh, versus unascertained deaths. And that doesn't seem to be the case given that the MRC have reported almost identically to what we have. So the only, the only explanation would be something like home affairs offices all closing down because of uh, staff infections and re deaths not being registered or something like that. But, but there's no signal to suggest that, that something massive has changed. Thanks, Andy. Sipa, anything from your side? Hi, sorry, I was struggling to unmute. Hi, thanks, Andrew, for, 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 for that um, uh, uh, talk. Now, Andrew, I'm just going to push you a bit. Um, so your, the modeling for the death seems to suggest uh, that it kind of mirrors what's kind of happening now and almost gives the impression that um, we won't have a, we would have a peak, but more of a sustained peak, almost like a table mountain effect. Um, does the modeling doesn't seem to suggest that in terms of cases uh, that we're going to see uh, are we my sense is that we might expect given the state interventions that we you know we've moved away from lockdown that we might have more of a flattened peak for quite some time as opposed to a peak which lasts two weeks and then things coming down um, Surely in the Western Cape, we should be looking at something that looks like a table mountain, a flattened peak for longer, which may mean that the, number, the peak number is a bit lower, just uh, more sustained. Um, uh, can you comment on that? Sure, so, so I think in the, even if the reproductive number comes down to 1.4, 1.3, you would still expect it to be, uh, it's, still a, it's still a multiplicative pattern. You still, you still expect to see more people week on week until you reach the point where where um, the saturation starts slowing the, the the number of cases and the number of clinical events, the the explanation for a, for a sustained uh, level of clinical events for a longer period of time, it probably has more to do with geographic heterogeneity that that we're going to have that we've seen the communities in which in which this has happened uh, uh, the epidemic has has uh, evolved very fast. And we've seen the clinical events in those communities, and as other communities kind of catch up, or or or, or transmission is a little bit slower, but there's but still large proportions of them get infected. So we'll see those events coming through, and that the the composite of all these kind of mini epidemics in different communities might give us what looks like a table mountain type type of effect. So there is a there is a there is a kind of a, a a mechanism through which we might see that. The models just don't have that level of complexity. We are expecting dist district models to come out from the national modeling team this week or next week. And that and, and when they start making a composite of lots of district models, we might see something looking a bit different um, from, from, from the outputs. Thanks. So Andrew, I just want to uh, ask you um, about two factors that, that could be um, affecting the trajectory of our epidemic and how you've potentially accounted them for for them in the model. The one is obviously we, you know, unlike other you know, countries that were hit rapidly and uh, with 
with the epidemic and had no prevention measures in place. Obviously, even though we're coming out of lockdown, there are a lot of societal prevention measures in place. Um, and those are obviously uh, sort of followed differentially in different communities. So you, you're potentially having uh, some communities that are still uh, you know, having reductions in transmission due to following prevention measures and others where they're not followed to the same extent. And so you're getting heterogeneity in that way. Um, and the other thing is that uh, in terms of the effect of herd immunity, assuming that it only has an effect on transmission um, when you get to 60 to 90 percent, is it possible that having some immunity in the population could be uh, sort of interrupting uh, transmission chains and, and having an effect on the slope of the curve earlier than 60 to 90? And has that been factored at all uh, in, in, in the models? Uh, thanks, Graham. So I think your first point is very similar to, to, to my response to Sipo's question, which is, which is I definitely think we've got different dynamics in different communities yeah. and, and what we're seeing is a composite. Um, and, and, and our pattern is very similar to most South and, Middle, uh, South and Central American countries. India There's a number of countries that, that the, uh, were able to Im institute uh, societal measures early on and didn't have those three, three to five day doubling times that Europe had. Um, but there's, like Brazil is probably the best example where there's just been this, this kind of uh, continued uh, climb in uh, clinical events, but on a on a slower uh, slower but consistent trajectory, um, mm. and and that might very well be the case with us. In terms of the um, whether the, uh, we may see a um, uh, something kick in before sixty to ninety percent herd immunity, so so there's lots of plausibility to arguments that there's some cross Cross protection from uh, common coronaviruses that there's there's genetic and other um, heterogeneity in around susceptibility, um, and that uh, it's not just the societal interventions, but it's something else about susceptibility that that has led to some of the decline in uh, in, in in places that are ahead of us, and. Um, it's difficult to model that because there's nothing to nothing to parameterize or calibrate against. But the likely way in which the modelers will will do that will to give us scenarios and and one way to a, a very easy artificial way to produce an epidemic that gives you the very uh, uh, fast exponential increase in cases early on, but then um, uh, tapers quite quickly is to is to fit the epidemic to um, to 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 40% of the population and then reflect it back onto the whole population. And then you get that curtailment um, mm. at a much lower level. And, and uh, the, doing that artificial as it is actually gives quite, quite plausible um, fits, to, fits to our data. The, the anomaly with our data is just that kind of flattening that's happened at a time when we would have expected continued increase. But our explanation for that at the moment is, is probably the geographic lumpiness. Mm -hmm. Um, Mark, uh, Sandra, any questions from the chat that you wanted to pose? Yeah, Graham, we can probably just finish with a few of these. Um, to Andrew Bull, um, quick question. The data that we incorporate, assuming is from both the public and the private sector, uh, that was the question. And uh, then whether using people's ID numbers to track to the population register would be a way of trying to track patients and the deaths. Um, I think that was the question. Uh, one last one to Mary Ann is hypertension as a standalone risk factor. Where is that in the continuum of risk? So you have isolated hypertension. Where does that stand in the continuum of risk? Andrew? Um, sure. So the um, it is public and private together. So because COVID is not a viable condition as an atypical pneumonia we've from the beginning gotten the data from the private laboratories and we get a, a daily list from the NICD that includes uh, all notifications for uh, province-wide um, and the um, we do rely on uh, 
private institutions reporting deaths uh, independently, but also they all also uh, send data to the NICD for a surveillance system called DATCOV. Um, there's a surveillance bulletin on the NICD website describing it. Um, and we get a slightly delayed, but uh, uh, we get a feed from them of all private sector admissions and, and deaths. Um, and we are we we have about a 75 percent completion of ID numbers on on the cases the confirmed cases laboratory confirmed cases and we are cross-referencing those with the population register um, and that's part of the reason why we have one of the adjustments for um, undiagnosed cases the exact uh, proportion of our under ascertainment is something we haven't uh, we're still waiting for, for more granular data back from the MRC on that Um, thanks. So uh, in our population analysis, the hazard ratio for hypertension was 1.3, um, so about a 30% increase in risk. It attenuated quite a bit once we restrict to cases or hospitalizations, but I think I've already uh, discussed that. Talking about treated hypertension, because that's the only way in our data set that we have of knowing that you have hypertension. Um, so these are people who have received medication for elevated blood pressure and the actual risk, if we had to look across all hypertensives might be um, higher than that. Thanks. Thanks, um, Graham. I wonder if I may just sneak in one last one because it's a relevance to people on the, on the webinar. We can close with that. Um, Marianne or Andrew, um, I'm sure many will know that the issue around uh, surveying um, communities, uh, the looking at wastewater or sewage and COVID fragments in that has become uh, a, a possible means of actually surveying community-based uh, SARS-CoV-2. Is there any uh, measure or tool that tells us about the actual quantification or the density of COVID-2 in a population using that technique? So I think Marianne, you're better placed, but if you want to unmute Leslie London on the on the I see he's on the on the participant list, he might even be better placed. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I think Leslie's Leslie's the best to answer that one. I may just ask Leslie actually ask the question, so maybe Leslie can help us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, I'm busy unmuting you. There we go. Um so, uh, yeah, I did ask you, I was wondering if maybe I could just, you know, think about the opportunities because uh, there are studies overseas which try and quantify a uh, COVID fragments in sewage as a way of uh, giving us a handle on what's going on in communities when we can't test. Uh, and that might just be an alternative way. Um, and so, on the one hand, we have deaths of patients, but on the other hand, we have some idea of how dense the infection is in communities and maybe between the two, we can get a better picture of what's happening. And in fact, the, the sewage, uh, in fact, they detected su uh, COVID in sewage eight weeks before the first cases appeared in China. So, um, I mean, they only detected it now, it's retrospective analyses, but it does tell us that it's a really powerful tool for us to get a handle on, on population level effects. Thanks. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so th that brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, just to say thanks again to Andrea and Marianne for jumping in at short notice. I think um, we're really fortunate to be able to call on colleagues like this to, you know, stand in at the last minute and really uh, still have a very high quality, high standard webinar that's uh, really informed us on the local epidemic and where we're heading. Um, just to say for next week, uh, we have three colleagues from uh, UCT and Khrudiskia, um, Vernon Lowe, um, Jessica Opie and Sean Wasserman, uh, who will be presenting on COVID coagulopathy, which is obviously one of the main uh, and severe complications of this condition. So over to you, Mark and Wendy, and thanks everyone for attending. So thanks everyone. I think we've had an amazing afternoon of really important to know what our local data is and what we need to expect going forward. So we see you all next week. Thanks very much.